Well, hello again. Uh, and today we're going to be jumping into space tourism. And um, what I mean by space tourism is basically private individuals who pay for the privilege of uh, taking a trip into space. And I've been sort of researching this uh, for a possible new series, which I'm not going to get into now. But in my research, two things stood out for me. Um, the first was that only seven people in total have been to space as paying private individuals. All of them went to the ISS. Uh, and the most recent uh, trip was way back in 2009, and that's almost 12 years ago now. Um, so you may be thinking that very little is happening in space, well, in space tourism, but that's all about to change. Uh, it's about to explode. And I'm talking everything from short hops, suborbital flights, um, the whole luxury hotel, and even the grand tour. So uh, join me as we dig into space tourism, and let's see if we're there yet. Before I do that, though, uh, just one thing to let you know. The first three books in the Belt series are now uh, together as one volume, one audiobook volume up on Audible, and I'm going to be giving away uh, some free codes. So if you want to get a copy of that, uh, just stick around to the end of the video, and I'll let you know how you get them. So, in the meantime, let's get on with space tourism. Between 2001 and 2009, seven private citizens ventured into space. They each travelled on board a Russian-sized spacecraft and spent about a week or so at the International Space Station, presumably enjoying the scenery. Um, the very first was, back in 2001, was Dennis Tito. Uh, he was an American businessman. And originally it was planned that he would go to the Mir space station, but when Roscosmos decided to decommission the station, he managed to get his trip transferred onto the International Space Station. Now, of the seven tourists so far, six were men and one woman, who was an Iranian-American businesswoman, Anushi Ansari, who spent nine days on board the ISS. One of these intrepid travellers, Charles Simone, was so impressed that he went back twice. He was there once in 2007 and then he went again in 2009. And as an interesting aside, the British singer Sarah Brightman, the ex-wife of Andrew Lloyd Webber, was also planning a trip, but she pulled out of training back in 2015. However, space tourism put on hold when the space shuttle retired in 2011, and then, of course, the Soyuz became the only means of getting um, astronauts to the ISS. Now you may be thinking that not much has happened since 2009, but you would be wrong, as there have been numerous organizations working feverishly for years to get private citizens back up into space, including NASA. And in June 2019, they announced a plan to reopen the International Space Station to space tourism once again. So where are we now? Well, for that, I'm going to break down space tourism into three primary categories. The first one I call is the day tripper. Now the undisputed leader in this area has to be Virgin Galactic with its uh, Spaceship 2 rocket strapped underneath an aircraft, or a carrier aircraft named White Knight 2. Now the planned trajectory of this would achieve a suborbital journey where you get a short period of weightlessness at the very height. The spaceship itself is carried to about 16 kilometers or about 52,000 feet underneath this uh, carrier aircraft, White Knight 2. Fire, fire. Then it separates, powers up its engine and, and continues on to about 110 kilometers above the Earth. That's about 10 kilometers over the Kármán line. And the Kármán line is, is a kind of a general definition of where space actually begins. Now the time it takes from liftoff uh, to touchdown is about two and a half hours. Uh, and the suborbital part of it itself, that bit where you're technically in space, would last for approximately six minutes. And during that six minutes, the passengers would be weightless and able to float around. They can also enjoy the views of space and Earth through the massive windows uh, situated all over the cabin. Current ticket prices are estimated to be over 250,000 US dollars per trip. Um, and there have been no flights so far, so it hasn't started yet. But that said, uh, they have passed most of the stringent aviation requirements with only a few remaining. So it's a possibility that we'll see the first commercial flight by the end of this year. The next entrant into this category is Blue Origin with their new Shepard rocket. Now this is much more of a traditional way to get into space. You're strapped into a capsule on top of a 
rocket booster. And again, this is a suborbital flight, so it reaches about 107 kilometers uh, above the Earth, and that's again just above the Kármán line. And again, like Virgin Galactic, the, the passengers will be able to experience this period of weightlessness and enjoy the views of space and the Earth from these absolutely enormous windows they have all around the capsule. Now, unlike the two and a half hour flight you get with Virgin Galactic, this one is a brief trip. It's 11 minutes approximately from the moment it lifts off to the moment the capsule touches back down on Earth. Um, as for the ticket price, well, Blue Origin have been a bit coy on that. Other than to say that it'll be in line with the competition, which I presume means somewhere around the same price as Virgin Galactic. Now, they've just had a successful flight, another successful flight back in January of this year, and I think the next flight due sometime in April is they're planning to have some crew aboard. Now, these are probably going to be Blue Origin people, uh, but assuming all goes well after that, I don't think it's going to be long before they start accepting paying customers. The next category is what I call the multi-day hotel break. Uh, now, ever since NASA announced back in 2019 its plan to open the ISS to space tourism once again, several companies have been hard at work trying to make that a reality. But the most interesting of these, I think, is Axiom Space. Now, they are planning to spend four private astronauts, as they call them, up to the ISS on a commercial SpaceX Crew Dragon mission. And that's scheduled to happen sometime around January 2022. Uh, and this is going to be the first of a a lot of planned trips they have um, these are going to be regular trips up to the ISS and of course when that happens in January it'll be the first time in over what 12 years that a private citizen has been to the ISS now interestingly there was much uh, speculation that Tom Cruise would be joining this mission uh, in a deal to shoot a movie uh, or shoot scenes for a new movie um, but it looks like uh, fans would be disappointed because uh, he was not on the crew list for the mission uh, in January. So disappointed, at least for now. Uh, now, Axiom Space are not going to stop just at uh, facilitating trips to the space station. Uh, their plan is actually to add some additional modules onto the ISS and ultimately to create this new commercial space station. And NASA have already given the go ahead for this. Uh, and the first of these modules is due to dock sometime in 2024. Now, the interiors have been designed by Philip Stark, a very famous uh, uh, designer. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he designed the ship for Steve Jobs. I think he did. Anyway, the, you know, the interior is going to be, you know, adorned with plush padding and furnishings and, you know, everything for a luxury stay. Ticket price, well... Interestingly, when NASA announced opening up to the ISS to paying customers, it also quoted some rates. Okay, so uh, you're talking 11,250 US dollars per astronaut per day. That's for life support, um, toilets, that sort of thing. Then an additional 22,500 a day for all the necessary crew supplies like food and air and medical supplies. And then a $42 per kilowatt hour for power. Anyway, all that comes to a nightly rate of about 35,000 per person, uh, which is a pretty expensive stay, let's face it. However, this is all wrapped up into the ticket price uh, with Axiom, uh, which is estimated to be around $55 million to get you up there for 10 days. Now the prize for just sheer ambition has to go to the Orbital Assembly Corporation and the recently announced Voyager station. Now this aims to open sometime around 2026, uh, which I think is a little ambitious. But anyway, um, as you can see, it is very reminiscent of the station in uh, 2001 A Space Oddity. We have this kind of rotating toroidal design um, which should provide, they say, a simulated one-sixth Earth gravity. So that's pretty similar to the moon. Um, it will have room for up to 280 guests and 112 crew members. Uh, and they're gonna kit it out with all the hotel amenities that you expect from a luxury property. So there'll be restaurants, entertainment, gym, spa, shopping. Uh, I think you'll even be able to take a spacewalk while you're there. So really, this is, this is a luxury resort in space. 
Around the outer ring, you can see these lifeboats or emergency return vehicles, as they call them. Now, these to me all look like the Dream Chaser space plane from the Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, which the development of which is a very interesting story in itself, and maybe I should do something on that sometime. But long story short, that has yet to fly. Um, there is a cargo version set to lift off in late 2021 with possibly a crew rated version sometime around 2026. So it's cutting it tight if they want to get 42 of these <laughs> in place by then. But personally, I love this little space pain um, and I can't wait to see it in oper operation sometime soon. It's, it's a really interesting craft. Anyway, I digress. Um, also, the company's rendering of the um, Voyager Station Space Hotel, they have a Starship docked at the central port. Now, I imagine the economics of this sort of hotel would only work if large numbers of people can you know, be transported up and down at a reasonable cost, basically. The lower the cost, the bigger the market. Um, now, they're quoting a three and a half day trip to the hotel is expected to cost around five million, uh, which is, you know, it's a lot of money. But it's dramatically cheaper than the 55 million uh, that Axiom are quoting to get a citizen up to the International Space Station. Now, our last and final category of space tourism is what I call the Grand Tour. Now, this term, the Grand Tour, actually comes from the mid 18th century when it was popular for young nobility of Europe to visit um, cities and sites of classical antiquity and the Renaissance. Now, needless to say, this was a rich person's undertaking. So similarly for the truly wealthy space traveler of the 21st century, then, then where better to travel than to that most ancient and romantically evocative of all astral bodies, our very own moon. And it's even better if you can take a few mates with you to share the experience. And so we come to the Dear Moon mission. This is Japanese billionaire Yusaku Mizawa. And he is scheduled to fly on a SpaceX Starship on a trip around the moon sometime around 2023. Now he plans to take eight members of the public with him and in fact he's just finished a um, application process that he was running for a while where anybody from the public could apply to be one of these eight members. I think it closed somewhere around mid-March so if you're thinking about it you've I'm sorry but you've missed the boat on that one and according to the selection criteria on the Dear Moon website these individuals and I quote must demonstrate a potential for individual growth from this mission and ensure their experience brings further value for the world, producing societal contributions that will benefit humankind for generations to come. So there you go. Now the mission will take um, about three days to fly to the moon and then loop behind it in an orbit uh, and then spend the next three days returning back to Earth. And now according to Elon, um, these intrepid space travelers on the Dear Moon mission will go further than any other human has gone from Earth before, including any of the Apollo missions. Now the price, well, look, no one's saying, but I imagine it's not cheap. So what did we learn from all that? Well, there's a saying over here uh, that goes something like, you wait around all day for a bus and then two come at the same time. And it's a bit like that with space tourism. Nothing has happened for, you know, years, 12 years or more. And all of a sudden, it seems like everything is going to be happening uh, and going to be happening soon. Um, so if you always wanted to take a trip into space and you happen to have a few hundred grand lying around in spare change, then maybe um, the day trip with uh, Virgin or Blue Origin might be an option for you. Um, then again, if you're the type of person that has a couple of hundred million to spend, uh, well then maybe a trip to the ISS for a week or two uh, might be an option. Or if you happen to be in the billionaire class, then you might uh, consider the grand lunar tour with SpaceX. So let's a quick roundup of space tourism as it stands at the moment. So as I said before I go, uh, I did mention that the first three books in the Bell series are out now as one complete audiobook. Um, and I've given away a 50 free promo codes to give away, um, 25 for the US, 25 for the UK. So if you want to grab one, just pop me um, a message on my website, geraldmkilby.com, click the about and send me a message. Uh, and the first 25 from each region that uh, land in my inbox will uh, get a free code. Um, anyway, that's all for this time. Gotta go. Gotta get back to writing. Uh, and I'll catch you next time. Take care.